Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here, particularly our esteemed guest. Uh, my name is Jennifer Surratt. I'm a lecturer with the Center for the Study of Human Health, and I am the organizer of this speaker series, Race, Ethnicity, and Health, on behalf of the Center for the Study of Human Health. Um, this summer, as we saw, you know, uh, more um, racially justice, racial justice protests going on, I, I really wanted to um, do something in response. And as I'm in a, a health program, I thought we really need to look at health issues um, based on racial disparities, ethnic disparities, things like that. Um, and I've also been keeping an eye on recent news, um, talking about um, disparities in maternal morbidity right here in the United States, racial disparities in mater maternal and infant morbidity and mortality. Um, and that to me was um, the perfect issue to kick off this speaker series. So I'm, I'm really excited um, for this event. And I think that we're going to talk about some incredibly important, um, important things in, over the next hour and a half. So I'm going to introduce each of our speakers and my co-moderator and then pose our first question. And then we'll have a few questions that my co-moderator and I will ask, and then we will open it up to audience questions. So make sure you use the Q&A box for your questions. And when we're done with our questions, we will rely on that for um, more questions. So to start, we have Dazon Dixon Diallo, who is the founder of Sister Love, which is an organization that was established in 1989. Um, it was the first women's HIV, sexual and reproductive justice organization in the Southeast United States. She's also a member of In Our Own Voice, a national Black women's reproductive justice agenda partnership and co-chair of Act Now to End AIDS National Coalition. She's done a ton of things. Uh, previously, she was a member of the NIH Office on AIDS Research Advisory Council, Council and on the board of directors of the National Women's Health Network. She is also featured in a mural in, in downtown Atlanta at 20th Mary, 20 Marietta and Peachtree Street for Sister Love, one of 30 people that Wonder Root wanted to feature in murals that would be up to highlight um, leaders in the community for the Super Bowl. So check that out. And I just found out she does a radio show, Coronavirus Rhapsody, which you can find at wrfg.org. It's in the chat box through Radio Free Georgia. Um, next, we have Monica Simpson, who is the executive director of Sister Song, which is a Southern-based national membership organization that's dedicated to improving um, institutional policies and systems that impact reproductive lives of marginalized communities. Um, she has also um, had a long history of uh, justice-related organiza organizing, including against various human rights abuse, the prison industrial complex, racism, and systemic violence against Southern Black women in the LGBTQIA plus uh, community. She is one of four founders of the Black Gay Pride Celebration in New York. She is also a doula, so um, fantastic, love doulas. Um, she's on the board of uh, the Fund for the Southern Community and Highlander C uh, Center, and she is a singer and spoken word artist. Mm -hmm. So you can also, I think your first album was in 2015. I don't know, if, is that correct, right? I don't know <laughs> if there is more coming soon. There is actually in the studio now. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Okay, you'll have to let us know. Um, and we have uh, Rebecca Shansami Ellis, who is a faculty member at Emory School of Nursing um, and was actually my contact point for these other two wonderful panelists. Um, she has a long history being a public health worker and activist. She's field trained um, and has done some really amazing work on OBGYN issues, mental health, even like workplace issues and health. Um, she's done some of this work internationally, particularly some really fascinating work in Brazil on, on mental illness and um, the use of psychotropic drugs and adherence to medications and things like that and also nursing and health throughout the Americas. So has some really amazing international perspectives to provide for us. Also is pay, uh, teaming up with um, Ms. Diallo for a class. Um, so maybe they will talk about that. And finally, um, I have a co-moderator, um, Adora Ntugoku, who is one of my students. She is a senior at Emory majoring in human health and is also on the pre-med track. 
Um, she writes for me with um, on the Center for the Study of Human Health's blog, Destination Health EU. Please check it out. And she's written some really fantastic pieces on women's health and Black women's health. Um, so she's interested in um, women's health, including and beyond reproductive justice um, and fitness and exercise and nutrition and things like that. So she is co-muttering with me. So welcome you all. Thank you so much for your time. I want to start things off with a really general question that I would like each of you to um, address, um, you know, take a few minutes to talk about. Um, and that question is, what do you see as the most important issue related to race and reproductive justice? Um, so I don't know who wants to start with that one, but should I call on you? <laughs> Let's go in the order I introduced you. How about Dazon? How about you? I'm good with that. Um, thank you so very much, Jennifer. I am excited to be here. I'm excited for all of the folks who have tuned in to our talk this afternoon. I'm extremely honored to be here with Sister Monica Simpson and Rebecca Shinsami Ellis. This is amazing. And Adora, you're going to have to share your papers because mm -hmm. I'm excited to read them myself. Uh, and one last little piece before I answer the question. The name of the radio program is Sisters Time Women Speak. I was answering the name of the crazy song that I just fell in love with, uh, Coronavirus Rhapsody, which you can also find on YouTube. So the, I think that the most important issue related to race and reproductive justice, quite frankly, is centering Blackness. I think that until we just zero in, laser-like, and unpack everything that that means when we say center all of these justice issues in Blackness. So whether it's about dealing with the intersectionality framework so that we understand how all these different oppressions are connected in our lives as Black folk on the planet, not just in the United States, but also our representation and who gets to speak, who tells our stories, how our stories get told, that if it even if it's not us and that it's our allies or our co-conspirators and our comrades who are standing in their spaces on our behalf that we still center blackness in our conversations in our research in everything that we're doing i think that that's the most important issue because anytime we stray away from that we start invisibilizing what the core elements are around racial justice and reproductive justice aside from the fact that racial justice comes about because of the anti-Black sentiment that has been promulgated by white supremacy and patriarchy for centuries and centuries and centuries. It's also that reproductive justice belongs in the center of Blackness because it's Black women who brought it to us. And the reason is because both in the racial justice movement and in the reproductive justice movement, understanding how every aspect of our lives as Black people and as Black women is the core of everything we need to fix some of the challenges and the oppressions and problems that we're fighting. Thank you. Monica, please, your thoughts. Um, thank you so much for having me. This is so dope and amazing to be on this call with all of these brilliant folks. I'm very excited. Um, and to really build on what um, Dazon just laid out for us, because I think that that is absolutely fundamentally the core of this, right, is to center Blackness. Um, I would also say that what I think is really crucial right now when we think about reproductive justice and race and like all these things are coming to a head is that we cannot expect for our silos to save us, right? And I think that this is the moment that we have to in every single way possible, scratch any notion that we are doing this work, you know, in a singular way, and that we have to find the ways in which we um, connect at the intersections of our work. And I think that's something that has always excited me about the reproductive justice frame. It's excited me about the ways in which this framework has always centered race because it was developed by Black women. It has always centered the, the work of and the analysis of intersectionality, right? Um, because that is really what is, that's the only thing that's gonna save us right now. Um, I truly believe that. And, and that's what's gonna get us to liberation. And so if I could just, again, to add on to what Dazon has already laid down, it really is about building our work and, and, and being as intentional as we most possibly can be and as radical and out of the box as we've ever been in terms of like working across the different intersections of our work and finding the places where we do meet um, and building our power from that source. That's what I think is most important right now. 
Mm, I like this merging of ideas of um, um, centering blackness as the overarching way to, to get rid of the silos, maybe. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. I like that. And Rebecca? I think uh, my, my colleagues have really um, hit the nail on the head. Um, and the, the, for those who are listening, there may, may be some terminology that you might not be aware of. So when we're talking about intersectionality, this was um, a word uh, that was really coined in the work of Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and she, she's a lawyer. And she saw something in her cases, in observing a case that went to court um, and was eventually denied um, by a, a district judge, that there was this Black woman saying that she was, in, she was improperly treated. She was at the intersection of race and sex. So they, they contested that, oh no, black men work in that place and they haven't reported anything. And women work in that place and they haven't reported anything. So we have to realize that when we're talking about this centering blackness, we have to name what the issues are. Oftentimes in our work, when we try and do, um, in the mainstream, we try and do reproductive, reproductive justice work and we say, oh, well, we're really fighting for all women. Um, and we have to remember that who are the most vulnerable people? It's the people caught at the crosshairs of these intersections. And so if we don't center the fact that Black women face um, neither their sex or their race is protective for them. So they face the highest and greatest challenges when it comes to surmounting the systems at play um, and often at play in, in contention for their very lives and their very livelihood. So as we're centering blackness, we need to consider how can we protect the very people who are most affected by these things. So, um, and Dazon brought out something really key, which was um, voices. Who's being heard? Who's, who's at the table? Um, and so as we talk about reproductive justice work, as we ground our work in social justice, it's really important that, you know, what she mentioned allies. It's great to be an ally, to say that these things are wrong and this is how we need to fight against these things. But another aspect is move out of allyship because ally doesn't mean you're taking any other brunt of what I feel on the day to day. Um, but when you step into the role of being a co-conspirator or an accomplice, then you're taking on some of the risk for what it means to be in a space at the table where I'm not or someone who might look like me is not and be able to amplify the voices of those who might not be at that table and be able to really equitably fight for true justice in those spaces. That's my addition. Yes, that is excellent. Thank you so much for that answer and for all of your answers. Rebecca, I want to um, go to a follow up and uh, Monica and Days on, uh, I would like your input here too. Thank you for defining intersectionality for me. And it reminds me that perhaps we should also start by defining reproductive justice. So let's, let's define reproductive justice before we move on with um, our additional questions. Rebecca, can you start or anybody? Sure. I I don't mind starting. Um, <laughs> so reproductive justice um, is a framework and it's a movement, right? I think that's important for folks to really understand. And I think that really speaks to the power of um, what reproductive justice is all about, right? The framework was developed by 12 very strong, incredible, amazing Black women in 1994 um, in response to a time where healthcare reform was on the table and people wanted to understand how they were going to best respond to that moment and to make sure that reproductive justice issues like abortion access and our reproductive health care was not excluded from those very important conversations and that the most important communities that we were you know really organizing around and advocating for um, were centered in that conversation and so these black women came together called themselves women of african descent for reproductive justice and put a call out to congress in 1994 that said that you're going to listen to black women you're going to listen to us because we understand what's best for our communities and this um, work that they then brought together was about bringing to uh, understanding our reproductive health and rights from this social justice perspective and making those things come together. Um, and so that's how we have the birth of what we now know as the reproductive justice framework. The reproductive justice movement is a movement led by Black, Indigenous, um, people of color all across this country 
who are working within their communities and building power within their own communities um, around these different tenets of reproductive justice, which are one, the human right to have the children that we want in the ways that we want. And we see the connection to birth justice in this tenet of reproductive justice and maternal health and parenting justice and all those things that come into being able to have children um, in the ways that we want to in this country and honoring the history of our communities, our cultures that have really developed what we now know as birth justice in this country. Um, our second tenet is around being able to prevent or end pregnancies, right, um, with dignity and without shame and to be able to have access to that. And so this is where we get to talk about our abortion access work and access to contraception um, and all that we need to be able to prevent and end pregnancies, but to also determine our futures, right? Um, that's really what that um, tenet is um, really focused on. The third tenet is around our human right to be able to um, parent the children that we have in healthy and safe environments, you know, free from violence, free from state sanctioned violence, free from, you know, any of those oppressions that really make it impossible for, you know, our young people, for any of us to be able to live our best lives and to be able to determine our own futures, right, and live into our destinies. Um, and this this, other, this this newer kind of tenet of our work at Sister Song um, that has now really become really central to our work, and it hasn't, it hasn't necessarily been separated, but it's just like making it more intentional is about this human right to bodily autonomy, which is where we get to really break into conversations around sexual freedom, around how do we talk about the needs of, you know, LGBTQIA communities and their reproductive health and needs, right? Um, and we get to talk about that from a much more expanded um, uh, conversation and just be able to bring all those angles in. So those are the tenets of the work and a, and a little bit more about like the history and how that framework was developed. Thank yeah, you. if I could, sorry, Jennifer, if I could just add on to that, I'm so grateful that we've reached this fourth tenant. Thank you so much for that um, additional description and explanation and that inclusive language that we've added because as an organization that has been very intentional about the intersectionalities of HIV and reproductive justice as the movement that we belong to in addition to the, the HIV or the AIDS movement, is that we have consistently and always been working with people for whom the reproductive justice contexts that are so womb-centric have not necessarily spoken to or included them. And so while it's not as neatly packaged as saying reproductive justice, for a decade, for the two decades plus of reproductive justice, we've always said sexual and reproductive justice because sexual rights are also a category with in and of themselves in the overarching human rights framework that goes so far beyond the notion of access to reproductive health care services, as well as reproductive rights in terms of protecting the access and the, and the uh, ability for people to engage in making their own decisions about reproduction. There's a whole nother realm that we talk about that actually even to get to reproduction, we start with sex. And so I want to be the uh, loudest voice in saying yay for the four tenants, right? Yay for the four tenants. Uh, and I don't think I could add anything else to that definition because that exactly lays out who and what we are as sexual and reproductive justice activists. Um, I just want to say I don't have anything to add to those tenants because, I mean, Monica, she lives, breathes this all day. And so she's the She's, she laid it down for us. One thing I did want to highlight in our discussions, we talked about human rights. Um, and some, um, many of you do not know this, but I used to work for the World Health Organization. So the UN system has developed this universal declaration of human rights. But today, even till today, the United States has not ratified this. And so what does that mean? That means that the United States is, it, it sounds nice to say that, health and having reproductive access and, and uh, ability and mobility and all these things are great, but our nation has not said it legally, <laughs> that it believes in this and that things like health um, and education um, and housing and these basic things that, you know, even Glasgow says that these are basic things, um, are, everybody deserves to have that. So, um, so that's why these movements and these active voices are necessary because we need to move the needle on what our country is doing and how it's supporting um, 
it's people, it's human capital. I'm always like flabbergasted by this. Why do we not care about people? And why do, not, why do we not care about the people who most need the care? But of course, as Zazan mentioned earlier, we do have a history that's entrenched in uh, white supremacy, um, even as we look at the history of how reproductive health has been developed as a medical science um, in the US has been at the expense of black female bodies. And so, yes, we're good for experimentation, but no, we don't mm -hmm. deserve uh, comprehensive, complete supportive care. So these are mm -hmm. some of the, the, the things that are happening on the backdrop that we should be aware of as we're having these conversations. I'm so glad you raised that, Rebecca, because I think it's critical for folks to understand that, you know, these things don't come from nowhere, that they actually come from places of pain and experience as a way to sort of resolve and hopefully prevent some of these atrocities from happening. So for those who aren't, you know, studied in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it was actually crafted as a way that we could, and, and this is a basic thing, when, and this is hard for folks to understand, when the Second World War came about to end the Nazi overtake of Europe in the name of basically Aryan and white supremacy, and that there were more than six million Jews and other people, including uh, lesbian, gay, transsexual, transgender folks, uh, sexual, non-gender conforming folks, uh, black folk that when there was an effort to wipe people out, it actually was legal. Because as long as it was legal within that country, then it was legal for that action to taste. So what happens, and I'm saying this because this is what we're facing right now in our own country. So what happens when your country, there's one thing to have all of these agreements about what happens when another country uh, brings aggression or brings danger to the people in your country. But what happens when the people in the country are at risk and are being, uh, are being attacked by their own country, by our own government? Where's the recourse for that? And so the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the United Nations, which originally was the, uh, the League of Nations, was formed as a way to create a global agreement about what you can and cannot do to your own people because they are, they are human. And so there's a universal understanding of because I'm born human, that these are certain inalienable rights that I should have protected and have access to. Civil rights is actually named in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Political rights, like even this issue right now of wanting to declare sedition against protesters acting out their first to write their First Amendment rights is a violation of their political human rights, including trying to suppress our vote because it is determined that voting is a core human political right. But there's also the social rights that Rebecca spoke to, healthcare, education, housing, all of those things that we all collectively and socially need to have some quality of life and to live in dignity. A livable wage, is a human right because it is your economic right, which is also a core element of the Human Rights uh, Declar Declaration of Human Rights. Your cultural rights, the language that you speak, the religion that you practice, the faith that you hold, the, the people you come from, the land that you come from, all of that is codified in this declaration. And you want to sit, and there's others that came along along the way. There's rights for immigrants, there's rights for workers, there's rights around sexual identity and engagement, and so, and developmental rights. It is, it is our right to have what we need to develop our own communities, that, that you cannot bring environmental racism, you cannot bring gentrification without accountability, because that is a violation of our human rights. We're not holding these conversations in the United States because the United States has not agreed to all of these rights as principles to protect us. There are two major treaties that cover almost all of this. One is the Declaration on Civil, uh, Civil Rights, which we had refused to ratify. How about this? We had refused to ratify for decades, right? Ratification basically means the president signs it, but the, the Senate has to vote, right? It, it works the opposite way from legislation. 
So once the president signs on to something, then the Senate has to vote on it. The only reason we actually signed on to the, the, the Civil Rights uh, Declaration is because in order to go into Afghanistan the first time, the first war in the 91 under Bush 40, 39 or 40, whatever that number was, Bush 40, there was an absolute cry that you will not come into these countries until you sign that treaty. That was the first one. The big one for us is this, the uh, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. We, Jimmy Carter, happy birthday, President Carter, he's 96 today. Jimmy Carter signed that declaration in 1979, 70, uh, 80, somewhere in there. It has yet to be ratified, and it is the one thing that would give us the ERA. It yep. would deal with access to reproductive health and rights. It would deal with equal pay. It would deal with all of that, in turn, and including you being able to use that as a way to fight violence, gender-based violence. So understanding human rights is fundamental to understanding racial justice and reproductive justice and sexual justice and immigration justice and economic justice, all of these fights that we're about right now in these silos, as, as Monica talked about, that when you use the human rights framework as your core to look at all of these issues, it's not just an abstract aspiration. There's a way that we can practice human rights long before our governments even decide to sign on to them. It's important to know what they are. And it's important to that, that it, um, Dazon, I love you so much. But, um, it, it, and, it, and I'm sorry, Monica, it's the convention to, y'all know I got mental pause. No, it's so okay. It's the, <laughs> it's the convention to eliminate all forms of race discrimination is the convention that we have yet to, that we had yet to sign on to, that we had to in order to enact war. Yes. And I want to add the Convention on the Rights of a Child, the CRC as well. That's another one that is Thank really you. incredibly important to um, the reproductive justice frame and our work because it really is about protecting our children. And we have we are like one of maybe three countries <laughs> that have not, you know, ratified this either. So there's just so much that's into this, y'all. But I sometimes the human rights frame can seem really big and it, as it should, right? Because it's important because we're talking about the fullness of our lives. And a lot of people ask us a lot of times in the RJ space, it's like, oh, well, how do you all use this in terms of your organizing? The human rights frame is a powerful organizing tool, right? And so that's why it was important for those people who, you know, our 12 mothers who came together to create this framework for them to root this work in the human rights frame. It gives us a global perspective. It connects us, you know, to our folks across the world. And it, it gives us the, the power to be able to move in a really different way on the ground. Our, the work that we see now from the maternal health space um, that has been coming up around, you know, trying to really beat back the maternal mortality rates that are killing black women at a rate four times higher than white women in childbirth. That organizing and what we've been able to do in terms of policy work, culture shift work, came out of framing this as a human rights violation, right? So that's just one example of like how we've been able to use this human rights frame and to put our work before like the Committee on the Elimination of for Racial Discrimination, which is called the CERD Committee within the UN to help move different policies and processes and recommendations that has helped us to really shift the way that we've talked about maternal health in this country. So it's not just something that's abstract and something that you should just know because we should know. It is also a powerful organizing tool for us who are doing, for those of us who are doing this reproductive justice work, racial justice work as well. Very good. Um, I think our next question comes from Adora. First, I want to say thank you so much for your awesome words um, about the history of race and reproductive justice, the tenets, and how we can't, we quite literally can't understand race and reproductive justice without an understanding of human rights. So um, we've been hearing recently, especially recently, we've been hearing more about race and maternal and infant mortal mortality, particularly in the United States. But what other issues do we need to know about? I think um, my, other co my other colleagues have mentioned it as they've been talking that um, as we talk about these intersections and then Monica termed it, sometimes we operate in silos um, that there's there's an importance to look at a variety of things that are related to this. So if we look at maternal and infant mortality, 
what are all the things that surround and support um, a mother and a child, right? So think about that. So we talked about things like housing. So housing equity, you, we, we know the history of our country um, where you know the redlining that happened for basically 70 years um, that caused so many neighborhoods to become uh, disenfranchised, lack of businesses. So what does that mean? Uh, this mother probably has unstable housing, also doesn't, probably doesn't have stable work, employment. Um, so that's uh, an economic issue. And then also, what, what's the access to education? What's the access to food? Um, what are, what's the access to health care? Um, we know along with this has been that many, um, many communities who, who need to have health access, even to primary care, um, because it's not feasible to buy property in a community that is, uh, that is run down. You don't think that your business investment is going to be worthwhile. So therefore, you don't open a private practice for primary care in that place. So all of those people depend upon a hospital, which is for tertiary care, to go and get their services, even prenatal care. Um, so we have to think about all these things. And then the child, when, when the child's born, what type of environment is that child coming into? What supports are there for the child? So I think that when we talk about this intersection between uh, race, reproductive justice, and looking at other things, we need to look at all of these other pieces, the, uh, the economic aspect, the, um, the housing security aspect. We need to talk about the education aspect. But as Monica mentioned, um, Black women, regardless, actually, of their socioeconomic status, regardless of their level of education, are still four times more likely to die. So that tells us that it can't just be a happenstance because, you know, this mother grew up in, um, you know, days that I'm going to call it out. She grew up in Southwest Atlanta that has, you know, been robbed of all its wonderful glory and history and stripped. No, that's not the case. She, she could be from, like where I'm from, she could be from Northeast Philadelphia, which is a predominantly white suburban neighborhood in Philadelphia, um, and have four degrees, I'm talking to myself, and be making a sizable salary. And still, when I go into the hospital today to go and have a baby, I may not come back to my family. So we need to realize that there, there's something about race and racialized care. So um, the healthcare system comes out of a system of practices, comes out of legislation and policies that are uh, entrenched in white supremacy. You're like, no, no, don't say that, Rebecca. Well, we have to realize that the quote unquote fathers of medicine, like I mentioned earlier, did their experience experimentation on black bodies to advance the health of white bodies. So I walk into a system that already looks at me, looks at the color of my skin and says, you know what, you're going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy to deliver your baby. So at every step of the turn, when I say, oh, something doesn't feel right, I'm a little concerned about this. I'm perceived as someone who doesn't know what they're talking about, even though I've got four degrees. I know my body better than anybody else they won't listen to me. Um, we see this highlighted in, you know, more of the high level superstar cases like Serena Williams, who has more money than I do, but she almost died. Actually, they didn't act until she passed out and lost consciousness. So what if she didn't have a family member there that said, she already told you it's a pulmonary embolism. You have to go and do the, 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 uh, the, the chest scan and not a Doppler on her leg. So we, we need to realize that these things um, are racialized. That means because of the color of someone's skin, because race is not biological, it's not because there's something inherently wrong with black women that they are more likely to die. It's because of the system in which they're delivering and having their healthcare done looks at them as uh, um, either a liability or something that's expendable. So therefore the investment of time and resources not in it. Um, I'll stop talking, but I want to say one more thing. Um, this is why the focus of my research is on health workforce. So the, I look at how do we train the workforce that we're releasing out in the places that we're saying we most need them? What are the gaps in that? 
how can we start to work at mitigating some of these racialized structures so that the people that we're graduating from our health training institutions are already considering this so that when they step into a space, they're not thinking from a self-centered perspective. They're actually, they're actually thinking from a patient centered perspective that cares and looks at the whole patient and the perspective of what they need. So I'll hand it over. I, I was going to leave it to Monica right next, but the, and I had all this list when I got my questions and I was like, oh, I want this issue and that issue. And those are all specific issues. But where I think we are right now in this moment, and I'm going to sound almost like a slightly broken record, but even like a broken clock, I'm right twice a day. So I'm coming back to centering blackness, but it, this conversation is about centering black pain. Pain is an issue that is not afforded to us across the spectrum, period. The pain of what it means in terms of everything that you just talked about, Rebecca, the pain of seeing our sons and our daughters shot down like dogs in the streets or in their bedrooms, or in parks or in their cars or where or on the street but naked in the you know falling snow that the pain of what that trauma does to us the intergenerational post slavery pain that is traumatizing and that still is traumatizing even though I'm born 200 years from the last person who was enslaved and 150 years from the last person who was enslaved in my own family the pain that we feel just around the, not just the microaggressions, but every day that our blackness has a different sense of respect or non-respect, right? So all the way from J. Marion, you know, I don't even like using his name, but all the way from the people who used our bodies to the people who created and ran the protocols for the Tuskegee uh, syphilis studies, to the people who created some of the most uh, powerfully detrimental contraceptives when we first had oral contraceptives come on the scene that were creating all kinds of abnormalities or health uh, conditions and or sterilization or uh, different formations of our infants when they were born and ongoing issues that the that the fact that uh, we have this running joke about the reason you do not have a re this prescription epidemic, this opioid epidemic among black folk right now in the same way, because now that it's becoming urban, it's a different story, but not in the same way as white folk is because we can't even get pain medications when we have pain. So it's, 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 I mean, I think it's Dr. Dorothy Roberts who in her TED talk on race medicine talks exactly about how this shows up in the healthcare space and how our pain is viewed as some, we have to, you know how your mama tells you as black folk that we have to be, you know, 10 times better, 10 times faster, 10 times stronger, 10 times smarter, 10 times more accomplished than anybody of our white counterparts, just because that's how far behind we are set in this, in this inequity. We also have to express 10 times more the pain than what others are experiencing in order for that to be recognized. So the pain of all of this, I think, is a critical issue that we have to be able to talk about and understand. I think that that's finally coming to some realization just based on what we're seeing with so many co-conspirators and comrades taking to the streets right now on behalf of anti-Black uh, racial justice, right? A race, anti-Black racism and the fight for racial justice. I will say though, that when you think about the environmental justice movement, for example, and that ends up looking as if, so you can't get fooled by the surface of it, that it ends up looking like it's a partnership when we're talking about making sure that all people have access to contraception, that people have access to appropriate birth support and pregnancy and birth support, that people get what they need in order to plan their families appropriately. I am not confused that when they start to talk about contraception and population issues around the environment and this planet, they're not talking about white populations. They're talking about 
what black and brown people are consuming in this world and that we have to slow down or eliminate the fast pace of pace of growth of those populations so that we can preserve what really is the neo-colonial perspective that it really is about imperialism in a new way of creating a better environment so that those of us who are already privileged can have more privilege. I, I think that all of these issues, we can talk about the maternal uh, and more, the maternal and infant mortality issues, but if we don't center them in understanding that it's because people don't even think we hurt the same way, right? then we will not ever achieve the same level of respect, inclusion, and, and dignity, right, that we need in order to survive. And not just survive, but to thrive and live well with the same dignity and with the same sense of privilege that those who are already and have been for hundreds of years making decisions about us, without us, for themselves. Monica, do you have anything to add to that? Um, like an amen, Ashe. <laughs> there it is, you know. I, but you know, I, if I can just say one thing from my own lived, because I, I appreciate that all of us are kind of bringing in our own kind of lived experiences to this, and that is just also important to this reproductive justice work. Like we all, you know, one of the things we start every training off at Sister Song is we all have a story to tell. Um, and when I've been thinking about what you were just talking about, Dazon, like this, this, this notion of black pain, and there's, you know, they, they now are like trying to talk about it from, you know, the public health perspective, right? Of, you know, weathering, you know, that whole term of weathering, um, which is, you know, getting more and more attention. And I think we should be talking about it more. But, you know, I um, turned 41 this year and I have not had a child yet. And desperately want to have a child, right? And I have just been thinking about what does it mean to be thinking about when we think, you know, the human right to have the children that we want in the ways that we want. When you put that up against a global pandemic, when you put that up, up against, um, uh, you know, racism in this country and how it permeates every sector of our lives, um, when you put that up against, you know, having to see the countless reels of people getting shot down in the streets and like, it really is putting a different, um, I don't even think that we have the words yet or we've been able to really talk about the impact of this and the position that that puts certain people in and their bodies and their minds and their spirits and how that's connected to this conversation. Because when I, the, the more and more I'm talking to black women in particular, you know, who are, you know, around my same age or who are in the same boat as me, um, I'm also a lesbian woman. And so, you know, me thinking about how to even create family, there's a whole other level to that, right? Um, but we have like these conversations around infertility coming up now. People feeling like, you know, they're, they've waited too long. There's just so much to unpack that is connected to this race conversation um, when we think about our reproductive lives across the continuum of our lives. And as I'm now talking to uh, women who are like getting in their, their, their mid 40s and, and moving into their 50s, and we've been told, well, actually, we, we're not really told about menopause. That's a whole other conversation. But when it does hit, you know, and people start to, and they move into it, you know, people are talking about perimenopause more. It, you know, it's like things are happening, you know, um, at a faster rate now than what they have historically. And so, all of that's connected to racism, white supremacy in this country and its impact. And so it's not just like the real time impact of like, you know, again, seeing, you know, violence on the streets or, you know, different things like that. It's like this, 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 it's, it's just been this insidious, like slow moving train of how white supremacy is like just how it's just permeated through so much. And so I just wanted to bring that nuance to the conversation as well, too. It's like, you know, this, this stuff is really getting out of control and it's, it's and it's moving and I don't know, sometimes it feels like we are, we've been so much on the defense of just trying to protect the rights that we have that we haven't had the time to think about the impact of the stuff that we didn't even need to think about, but, it, but now that's on the table too, right? So I just wanted to just bring that bit of nuance to the conversation today too, because I think that's something that we are now gonna have to start to um, think about in terms of our strategies, our organizing, our political education, all of that. We're going to have to start thinking about those extra layers now as well. 
That's actually a nice segue to our next question, which kind of centers on solutions and strategies. Yeah. Um, what are some ones that, what are some solutions and strategies that work and what, you know, you know, a lot of the times people think that information goes from the West to the non-West, the global North to the South. But I think there's a lot to learn from areas that have done a good job at addressing maternal mor morbidity and reproductive justice. So maybe what can we learn from looking at our, you know, international, you know, global family to, to find some solutions there? So I'm, um, I was thinking about this question and I started going in and saying, let me go see what some of the work is that's going on out there and the data and that. So there are a few things that I think about in terms of the stories. And I, I would say that first of all, I think what has worked and y'all know I'm the big, you know, 30,000 foot, you know, thinker. I'm a macro thinker. And so I'm going to start with the fact that the UN exists, right? And that there are agencies within the UN that are set to look at these issues from a global perspective on a regular basis every day. One of my best friends runs one of these agencies. And the fact that we have what we know as the strategic development goals, which are a set of goals that look at all of the different challenges, uh, oppressions, problems, that exist at the macro level from a global policy perspective, all the way down to the cultural uh, nuances in villages and communities that impede or prohibit or actually destroy people's opportunities to live and grow well in their own families, in their own communities. I can't even run down all the SDGs for you. You can go look them up because it's a phenomenal framework. The thing is, is that U.S. exceptionalism has basically excused us from having to pay attention to a lot of the work that the U.N. does, including the International Criminal Court, where a lot of our leadership should end up. But it's also not thinking about or looking at, for example, the role that the WHO plays in addressing maternal and um, infant mortality and morbidity issues that it doesn't look at um, or that it does take a look for example at the role that things like early child what what some people call early child marriage which is about which in the sdgs is focused on eliminating it i actually call it culturally sanctioned sexual slavery when you're talking about marrying off your eight and nine and 10 year old daughters, they're not marrying off their young sons. They're marrying off young girls to older men and determining this from the time these babies are born. When they're talking about eliminating uh, female genital mutilation, that that in and of itself is in different countries by reducing and eradicating FGM, that they have also not by default, but with intention, also reduce maternal and infant mortality just by ending that particular act of violence against young girls and women. The fight to end gender-based violence also means that we are addressing ending maternal and infant mortality and morbidity. So thinking about, again, circling all the way back to intersectionality, that some folks over here who are fighting against violence aren't necessarily thinking that that actually is improving our maternal health outcomes and eliminating and reducing the impacts that that has. But when we know for a fact that for a situation where there is domestic violence and the woman is the victim in that case, when she is pregnant, violence increases actually. And it actually increases the further along she is in her pregnancy. And so just the fact that domestic violence in and of itself has an immediate impact on the well-being of that mother and her child at the time of pregnancy and at birth and post-delivery means that by eliminating domestic violence, we actually eliminate maternal mortality in different ways. And so those are some of the ways that I think that other countries are getting to the reduction in their maternal and infant mortality issues. And we are also creating policies that are making it harder for them. 
things like the president's executive order that we know as the global gag rule, which is actually somewhat codified in the Helms Amendment, which says that no U.S. tax dollar, it used to be it can't go towards providing abortions outside this country. But the current occupant of 1600 Black Lives Matter Plaza expanded the executive order to include providing information, education, talking about abortion, or even referring, some, referring the abortion services to someone else who is not even caught up in the global gag rule. And in order to receive these very, very crucial dollars that you may need to fight cervical cancer or to fight HIV and AIDS, because you do have an integrated program where HIV and STDs are a part of your reproductive health services, eliminates your opportunity for some very important US dollars because you are providing options across the uh, reproductive span for the people in your communities. So the global gag rule is one, and I, and I by extension also wanna say that conflating things like sexual trafficking and human trafficking, which also has a deep, deep impact on pregnancy and maternal outcomes and maternal mortality. But conflating human sex trafficking with sex, consensual sex work is also damaging because that means that people who are indirectly and voluntarily because of whatever reasons they need to or want to are engaging in sex work as a means of their uh, income generating practices, that by not allowing them unfettered access to sexual reproductive health because of the, the stigmas, the laws, and the judgments that criminalize their, their work, means that they are also at risk for never getting prenatal assistance or care, never getting access to the clinics, and never having a proper uh, delivery when they have children. And so uh, all of these things are not just um, critical in the individual existence that they are, but when you think about how they're all related, and that they all have sort of a domino effect with each other in the different directions that those dominoes might fall, then we have to look at the meaningfulness of the SDGs and how are we actually applying the SDGs to the issues we have right here in the United States. I think just to piggyback a little bit, um, I think there are some countries that are um, really doing some good work around this. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, um, I, I, I worked in the Americas region, across um, the Americas, but also um, in the Africa region. And so, um, I would say a country that stands out to me in the experience of how they have really worked to improve um, maternal and infant outcomes has been Ghana. Um, so, in the work there, um, you, you know, when we're, we're in this uh, kind of uh, post-colonization experience. A lot of countries are trying to develop for themselves what their countries would look like. And um, in, in recent years, so um, when I went to Ghana in 2008, I helped them with their first comprehensive review of maternal mortality in that country. So that's not just looking at deaths in hospitals, but deaths outside of hospitals and actually looking at what's, the re what's really happening on the ground around maternal mortality. And after they completed that study 2008, 2009, what they did was really worked more concertedly. Um, so between midwives and nurses in clinics um, and also with their traditional birth attendants. I think that in the United States, we've really, um, because um, I'm a nurse, so I'll, I'll be honest. So I'm speaking about my own people. Um, we have, <laughs> thank you. We, uh, what we've done with maternal health as far as midwifery goes in the United States is that we've eliminated the importance of what it means um, to have the experience and the knowledge of traditional midwives, um, ones who have been working in communities for the interest of uh, the communities in which they're serving. And some of these practices um, are even rooted in the, the cultural nuances and knowledge of that community. And so what I saw in the experience of Ghana is that they, they said, okay, yes, 
all these things that we're learning from Western medicine, there are aspects of it that we do need to do some cross training for our traditional community uh, birth attendants, that kind of thing. And then also on the health system aspect, we need to bolster what we're doing in terms of providing the key services. Like I went into maternity wards that had one bed. And so literally, if you had five mothers at night who were laboring, one on the bed, get off the bed, go sit down in a chair to do your post recovery, and then you got another one. And so that means within a couple of minutes that midwife had to sanitize the station and get another person on. So even thinking about what are, what are the, um, the, the structural kind of systems supply needs that are necessary in order to birth safely. So I, I, felt, I feel that they've done a really good job. They're one of the countries um, in, in um, Africa that, ha that met, um, that, that did a really great job in getting much more closer to uh, the Millennium Development Goals than many others. Um, uh, so, yeah, sorry, I just saw a pop question pop up. But um, when we're looking at sustainable development goals, these are the new ones. After, after uh, the, the Millennium Development Goals, the sustainable development goals became what took over. And some, some, some of the goals got collapsed and some got expanded. Um, but um, Dazon has pointed out some very key things that we need to keep looking at. So. Yeah, y'all, again, I'll just be saying amen and I shade to all the things that y'all like lay out for us. Um, and I wanna take it for you all when thinking about like solutions and things like that, things that we have like learned and seen from our global community also here in the US and have like really helped to shift the way that we talk about these issues, right? Around maternal health, reproductive justice issues, all of the sorts. The first thing that it's kind of building off what you were saying, Rebecca, um, a lot, you know, I am a doula. Um, I did my work with the International um, Center for Traditional Childbirth with um, Mama Shafia Monroe for many, many years. And what we, she has been a, a, a deep, student herself and also connector of um, those folks across global communities um, who are birth workers, midwives, and how do we continue to make these practices stay alive here in the U.S.? Because what we don't realize in a lot of these different states in the United States of America, if you don't have the letters behind your name, right, that give you the credentials within the medical industrial complex, then you are criminalized from, you know, being able to operate and, and move in your own ways, right, as a birth worker, as a midwife, that is so cultural and it comes from generational knowledge and expertise, but that is not seen as, um, again, credentialed within this, this larger system that we're living under. And so we've been able to think about how do we, you know, break that down, right? And to like bridge that gap. Because again, it, it is off the work of grand midwives in this country that we have this system of OBGYNs and all of it. If it wasn't for who they were um, to the communities um, that they serve for, the, for themselves and for those they probably didn't want to, of course, right? That we wouldn't even have this system. And so that's one of the things it's like, you know, how do we continue to break down, the, break down these barriers of those folks who are community-based midwives, community-based, you know, birth workers, um, and you know, making sure that they have ties and connections to those folks who are doing work within um, you know, our service delivery places and different things like that. But that is just a solution. It's like when we empower, when we resource, when we support community-based birth workers, we get better, we get the health outcomes that we want, right? Because these birth workers are the most, they are reflective of their own communities. They understand their communities. You know, learning from the grand midwives I get a chance to sit with now, midwives were not just catching babies. They knew families. They knew generations of families. They they knew your health chart before you even knew how to chart a health chart. They knew all of that, right? So the, the, these are just important things that we have learned from our global um, uh, family, right? That we can't allow that to be lost within these systems here in the United States of America. So that's one solution is like, how are we empowering and resourcing and moving more um, attention to those who are working at the community-based level um, around birth work, right? Another solution that we've, um, th that I think is important for us to lift up is cultural workers in general. When we think about culture shift work um, in this country, and it's a conversation that I'm so excited. It's finally getting, you know, the light that it deserves because I do consider myself to be a cultural strategist. It's how I think about work. It's how I think about organizing and doing the work that we do. Um, and, you know, when we think about our global family, whether they were, you know, 
fighting for their own communities around better, better birth outcomes or fighting against, you know, folks, you know, around abortion access. Like we have seen culture workers use art, use, um, you know, messaging and everything to really push their work forward. And I think that that is incredibly important when we think about solutions is who's the messenger? What is the message? And how is that message getting to the broader community, right? And that, because that is what's going to give people their entryway to your work, their entryway to um, getting what they need. And so that is incredibly important. We have to pay attention to that. And we can't see that as something that is like separate from the healthcare work that we need to do or the policy work that we need to do. It is equally as important for us to understand why culture shift work, cultural workers are incredibly important and solution, they are the solution, right, to how we make these the, the change happen that we want to see. Um, something that we've also taken from, you know, a global context when thinking about research, we have to invest more in Black researchers. We have to invest more in Black research. We have to invest in Black researchers. Okay, period, point blank. And I think that one of the, the, the things that I've really enjoyed, you know, learning more about and, you know, strengthening my own skills around comes from global work, the community-based participatory research model, right? When we think about that CBPR, is that right? Community-based, yep, uh-huh, CBPR process. <laughs> it has been that process that is all about being community-centered, community-driven, and bringing that, those voices, those concerns, that to the forefront. That has been some of the most transformative work that we um, have been able to lean into at Sister Song. We did a CBPR process for our work with the Center for Reproductive Rights around the maternal mortality issue, which has now grown into the work that is far beyond what we even thought was possible um, and it's also you know really important and crucial to the development of what we now see as the black mamas matter alliance that started with the cbpr freaking process right of us like going into these southern states and finding these and, and, and connecting with our community we also just completed one around our trust black women work i'm not sure if folks remember 10 years ago these crazy billboards came to Georgia and other states across the country saying that the most dangerous place for an African-American child is in the mother's womb and shaming black women for their reproductive decision making. And thus, you know, starting like this crazy racist, you know, anti-abortion rhetoric and all that kind of good. It's not good. It's just crap, whatever. But, you know, for us, it's like, you know, when we, as we're thinking about, you know, this now being a decade of us having to think about messaging or how are black women talking about their own lives? What do black women see as like the most important things for them right now? We engage in another CBPR process with Ivy's Reproductive Health to be able to go in and find those stories to get to the root causes, right, um, of our issues and to be able to highlight those things. So again, this has given us an opportunity to allow Black women to define themselves for themselves, to speak for themselves, um, to be able to create their own solutions coming directly from community. So I think that's another solution that I think is really important for us to um, lean more on, to learn more about if we don't know um, more about them um and so yeah I'll, I'll pause there because i think those are just some key ones right there but because i want to get to some of the questions that i'm seeing come through the chat yeah just very quickly i'm going to update that on the fact that we made the decision because we learned about community-based participatory research at sister love long in a long time ago because we had created for example in our communities for us, by us, our own prevention intervention. It's called the Healthy Love Party. And it was created as a way to make a safe space for Black women in particular to talk about HIV, talk about AIDS, talk about changing how we've all been socialized to engage in our sexuality, our sexual conversations, all of that, provide information, but also make it very fun, make it exciting, make it somewhat erotic if we could, so that people could understand what they could say yes to. And then they come along, they meaning the public health infrastructure, like the Centers for Disease Control and their efforts to look at different ways across different populations to address HIV, came up with these models called evidence-based interventions, all created for the most part on institutions, university campuses. Yes, I say it here, the intervention that came up for Black women actually took parts of Healthy Love and included it in their intervention. Got over $5 million for five years to research their intervention that then became a 
part of the CDC's overall mechanisms to deliver this prevention work. And we said, oh, hell no. So we had to figure out how do we get to that? And that meant we had to build our own capacity to learn how to research our own, to really literally, as the Afri African counterparts say, African problems will be solved with African solutions. So how do we solve our Black women's problems with our Black women's solutions and get the same level of credibility and inclusion and funding to figure out how it works? We have then engaged in a five-year evaluation study. It was a, a double level, I'm, I'm not getting it right now because we did both group and individual level intervention uh, research, but it was a formal, rigorous, randomized control study that came out at the end saying this intervention doesn't even have to be uh, boosted like the other ones because we decided when you use the social networks, when you do the education with groups that are going to see each other on a regular basis with women that commune with each other in church or at work or in their communities or in their neighborhoods or on their dorm halls, not just their campuses, that the information they learn together is going to get reinforced naturally and organically. We became an evidence-based intervention out of that. And then we said, you know what, it was great that we were able to do that as a community-based partner with the CDC and the, the university we partnered with. How about we built our own capacity to actually conduct our own research, to design our own protocols, to figure out how to approach the IRB and get it uh, approved so that we could implement. So in the past year, we were actually funded for our first, what we now call community-led, I actually call it people-based community-led research, where we designed the study, we put together our community advisory board, we hired Emory University's RISE Center to support us with the technical pieces, but the study is a community-led, community-designed, community-driven, and it will be a community-published study that is reported to the community before we decide that it needs to be peer reviewed in another type of journal. Because if we are not uh, getting the sign on and the affirmation from the very people who were involved in the study to say that this study is answering some of the questions we needed you to answer, then the study might as well be for naught. And we don't want it to be for naught. And so that's why. And, and I would say that the other part to what Monica is talking about is the role that community engagement plays. And I just want to come in with one last win, right? Most of the big NIH studies, right, that look at even the maternal mortality studies, they really, when they go and give these millions of dollars to institutions, including basic science, you know, just looking at how molecules, maybe they're safe or not, maybe the drug is safe, and before we even get to the next phases of the study, that they are required to partner up with other institutions. They're required to partner up with industry, like pharmaceutical industry. They are required to partner up with laboratories. They are required to have a community engagement strategy, I'm using quotes there, but they have never been required to partner with community. The problem with that is that all of those partnerships came with money. So you need community engagement, but you don't require the study, uh, the, 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 the researchers to partner with the community organizations that are the gateways to your communities that you need to participate in your studies. That has to stop. And that community research needs to be elevated to the same level as institutional-based research does because we do it right when we build our capacity, but also the community-based organizations that you have to partner with in order to do your community engagement strategy have to be required in your studies going forward. And one of the first big studies that has come out of the NIH to refund, to renew for the first time, and this is the third round of this five-year multi-gazillion dollar study on uh, finding the cure for HIV, this is the first time that the actual FOA, which is the funding opportunity announcement, has required a community-based organization as a partner. This is the role that we have to take when we're leading from a reproductive justice standpoint, when we're, reading from a, when we're leading from a racial justice standpoint, is to not only be able to say and to demand inclusion, but to be able to show up when we are included 
with what matters for us and receives the dignity and the respect and the dollars that we deserve to get to be a part of that, to develop our own communities and to solve our own problems. Thank you so much, everyone, for your words. Um, our next question is, with, with systems entrenched in white supremacy and also like dealing with bias from physicians, what advice do you have for women of color in navigating and advocating for themselves in healthcare systems? I think it's important for, um, we had a couple of, I think it was like two years ago, we, I was at this convening and it was a kind of like birth justice, maternal health space. And on the panel was like this very well noted, you know, doctor. And she's a black woman, you know, black OBGYN. It was like, okay. And, um, you know, there were questions coming from the audience and this doctor said, well, you know, I have these patients that come in here that they, they, they didn't done their research off Google. And like she had an attitude behind this. And when I tell you that energy from that, that, that black practitioner reverberated through the crowd and we had to have a complete stopping moment, right? Where we had to silence the whole room and like really take in what we had just experienced, right? We were a room full of black women, mostly, looking at this black woman who we would, who we, who we would think was going to like be an advocate for us and, and do that from a way that made us see ourselves and feel connected. And there was a complete disconnect, right? And so it was one of those moments for me in, in, in my time of doing this work where you just have those moments where you just, things just come back into focus for you in a different kind of way. And that was one of those moments for me. And so when I think about this question, um, I, I think about how important it is for us to be able to, um, to do the work where we are, where we don't feel shamed about understanding our own bodies and knowing our own bodies and, and doing whatever research we wanna do, right? Uh, for ourselves and to be able to, uh, you know, equip ourselves with that information, to be able to ask the questions that we wanna ask. And we know that we're working under very strange systems, right? Because we only get but so much time and, you know, all of that. So I think that it's important for folks to arm themselves with as much information as possible, to ask as many questions as they absolutely can, to make sure that you are extremely clear about everything that's coming out. I always tell people to repeat back what they told you um, so that you all have a mutual agreement about what's been said to you about your diagnosis or whatever's going on. Um, I think it's important for us to create circles of support around us when we're going in to ask questions or when we're thinking about our own health care. We cannot do this alone. We should not have to do this alone. Um, and so whether it's just going for your regular checkup or you're going to figure out, you know, what you need to have done, whatever it is, it is important for us to create systems of support for one another um, and to not feel like we have to do this work by ourselves and that we have to hold all of this by ourselves. I actually also, I was born and raised in the rural South. Access to information was like non-existent. You know, you had to like really find this stuff for yourself in the best ways that you could. Um, and so there's no access to sexual education that's comprehensive in any way. And that is just, that's just the reality that's still a reality, right, for our folks. And so we have to be our own um, educators. We got to be our own advocates. Um, and that means that we need the support um, to be able to hold that and to get what we need from these systems that are not really designed to really support us in the ways that we need to. Um, and I think that for me, that something that's also been really important um, is to think about what are the support systems outside of the medical industrial complex that can actually get you um, the type of support that you want and can get you um, access to information in different ways. We have lots of other channels in our communities where information flows and we can have access you know, to to, you know, to what we need. And so we have to be able to just look at all of those things. That's something that's come out of a lot of the research that we've done is that people are not looking to their doctors and to, you know, just in these, in this, this, the, the way that we've 
been conditioned to believe that this is how we get that information or how we need to engage. Like there's so many different ways of doing that. So, the, I mean, that's just some of my off the head top thoughts around that because we just have to be able to advocate for ourselves um, and demand what we want and demand to be trusted. Um, I, I have to say, thank you for that, Monica. Um, we, we do need to be our own advocates. Um, speaking as a healthcare professional that uh, worked in labor and delivery and postpartum care, um, don't be afraid to say what you need and what you expect from your healthcare provider. Um, pe people who are not Black, Indigenous, people of color, are saying to their providers, so this is how I want my experience to be. And this is, these are all the questions that I have today. So you deserve that as well. So do not undercut the power of your knowing um, and needing to know from your provider. That is their role, that's their responsibility. And it's okay to speak for yourself. And if your provider does not want to listen to you or dismisses your concerns, guess what? You have the power to take your money your insurance card, whatever it is, to someone who will. So um, I think that that agency of knowing that you you do have a choice. So you 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 can go to another provider, whether it's within that practice or if that practice itself does not allow you to voice your thought, then you go somewhere else. Um, there are other kind of social support networks that are kind of being formed around social media. Um, and different um, uh, support groups like on Facebook and um, and also there are some people who are kind of rising up as kind of these social entrepreneurs, so to speak, who are looking at how can they create um, safe spaces for women to talk about uh, kind of reproductive health, uh, maternal health, all these kinds of things. Um, and then there are your traditional, you know, like once tradition, there are different apps as well. So people are creating apps that are free to access and then there are forums on there. You can ask questions. But remember that on Google, there's also Google Scholar. So as you re re look up topics, so if it leads you to a maybe New York Times article talking about issues around uh, Black birthing, well, go to Google Scholar and type in those same keywords so you can find a scientific journal article that you're like, here, this article says that I can't have a VDAC, you know, <laughs> uh, it proves that I'm a, that no, I am not going to go through another cesarean that I do not need because you thought, oh, you're taking too long to have your baby and I need to get out of here. So we're just going to induce you. Uh, well, no, mm, the induction is taking too long. You're going to get a C-section. So there are ways that we can advocate for ourselves uh, because we do know if you receive oxytocin, this increases the likelihood of you having postpartum hemorrhage. Oh, they didn't tell you that. It increases the likelihood of you having postpartum hemorrhage. So it, and, and of course, the likelihood of a C-section because we know that, um, that for some reason, depending on your, um, depending on certain lipids within your body, um, oxytocin doesn't work so well when they give it to you. So um, there's some research looking at that, which I, I still find is problematical because it's very racialized, but, um, but it's important to know what the science is saying so that you can advocate for yourself. And if you can't interpret the science, there's so many online forums and kind of networks that are being built um, for Black women um, that you can tap into. Um, and I want to put a quick plug in. <laughs> Before our time is over, um, I um, am chairing a session for the American Public Health Association Public Health Nursing section. Um, it'll be a free session um, as part of the APHA annual meeting. Um, and, it, and this session goes on annually. It's called the Racism Pre-Conference Session. But this year will be just the title is Birthing While Black the impact of obstetric violence and responses to systemic racism in maternal health. And so that will be on October 25th. Um, and that's 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern time, but 4 to 7 p.m. Mountain time, because the conference is being held in Mountain time. And um, I will make sure to add uh, the registration link into um, our chat box for you all to put, press on that before we leave, um, because we need to continue these conversations. 
we have about 10 minutes left and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So let's go around and maybe have some final comments. And if you, and if you would like, we have a couple of questions about what can I do? What can I do as a non-healthcare worker? What can I do as a white co-conspirator? How can I make sure the white people I know going into healthcare knows about this? I mean, obviously you can share the link to this discussion as a start, but yeah, so um, maybe in your final comments, let's, um, if, if you have thoughts on that, then that would be fantastic. Or anything else you wanna make sure you get in before our time is up. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, are we gonna take some questions or, cause there, if I added one thing to uh, what everyone was saying, cause I think Monica and Rebecca have both laid it out beautifully. Mm. Uh, before I get to, 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 to well, one of the things I would get to in your question, Jennifer, is that there's also the, there's this thing that we talk about, especially with Black women, around this thing called knowing, right? That there's this, there's just this thing that we have, and that there's no way to actually explain it. You can tell a story about it that expresses it, that gives you a sense. It's almost a metaphor for how we make our decisions. But it is that, that knowing that can be trusted. Uh, and I don't mean to sound trite in any way, but there's that knowing that means I may not like you, I may hate you because of the color of your skin, or I may be afraid of you because of the color of your skin, but you can still raise my child, right? Because of that knowing, you know, there's the fact that there are things that you're telling me, but because I have a white coat, because I have degrees, because you're sitting there and I'm standing here, that what you're saying is not relevant or doesn't have a place here. But what I'm actually threatened by is that knowing. And so first of all, you have to respect that knowing. And if, you have that knowing, you have to have that self-respect for that knowing and believe and trust in that because that is your power. That's your power that, that bubbles up as sometime intuition, bubbles up sometimes is what my Nana would call the God voice. So it's that thing that just comes with the fact that you are. And so in this instance, when you talk about how do we get each other to that degree, the first part is, oh, uh, the part I forgot about is, is don't forget to know more about your body than anybody else. If you haven't seen your cervix yet, get yourself a speculum, a flashlight, a little bit of lube maybe, and a mirror, take a look at it. For those who have their cervixes, who have cervixes to look at, who can, who can insert things in their body and look at those body parts, it's important to know more about what's in there than the person who is looking at it from the other end right? That you want to know it, claim it, cherish it, own it, accept it, love it, protect it, all of that kind of stuff is really important. Now, in terms of what Rebecca said earlier about allies versus co-conspirators and comrades, for my white folks, what I'm first going to recommend that you do, because I know she's here, and I was going to say it anyway, but I'm glad she's here, is that come November, Loretta J. Ross will be be re -enter, re, uh, re offering her white supremacy in the age of Trump course, which is very affordable and amazingly not just informative, but it is also interactive and it is deeply engaging. And for a lot of people that I have followed who've been through that course, it has been life changing in how they show up, how they articulate, how they understand and how they stand beside and sometimes behind those folks who are needing to have that voice. I will, I will close with my favorite, most recent uh, quote from somebody, and that's Congresswoman Ayanna uh, Presley, who when we had our last in-person uh, day of action on the Hill on behalf of Black women and reproductive justice within our own voice, she spoke to the crowd and she says that she believes that the people who are closest to the pain must be closest to the power. So if you can ask yourself that question, how close am I to this particular pain from the next person or the next person, and who among me is closest to that pain? You seed that space with all the support, 
all the resources that you have in your own privilege to make sure that that person who is closest to the pain has access to that power where you don't have that. And so where you don't have that same pain and that same story to tell. That I think is probably one of the most important lessons that you can figure out for yourself in how to be the best comrade and co-conspirator. And sometimes instead of checking your privilege, right? is to cash in with your privilege, right? To cash in with your privilege on behalf of somebody else, whether you have to speak up in a medical school class that's gonna talk about black bodies differently from other bodies, whether it's going to be an exclusion, whether you're sitting at a table full of people uh, who are all looking alike and there's that one person who is not looking like everybody else, who doesn't get a voice or who has something to say and nobody hears it, but when one of the other people says something, they, they adopt it. Don't let that pass without recognizing that, without calling that in or calling it out, whichever the situation requires. Those are the things that you have to do. It is about seeding space, cashing in privilege, and making sure that you are able to step back when it's not your place to step in. Yes, doggone it, they done. <laughs> Sam, put me in, Coach. Sign me up. Um, I would just add really quickly just three things um, for you all tonight. Again, thank you so much for having me on this, this conversation with these brilliant folks. I'm super grateful, and thank you all for the organizing and making all this go down. And for everybody that's on this webinar with us tonight, mad love to y'all, too. One first thing is, you know, Learn about your RJ organizations, good people. There are amazing reproductive justice organizations all across this country doing incredible work. Um, so look them up in your state. You can go to rjforblacklives.org. Um, that is a really solid list of organizations who are like really committed to um, centering black lives right now, which is an important work. Um, but you can find out where these organizations are if they're in your area get connected to them. Um, Sister Song is always here for you. We are, we would love to be your movement home. Um, and we would love for you to get closer to reproductive justice through the work that we do. Um, we are a training organization. And so we um, have a very powerful, beautiful curriculum that we move across this country now virtually um, <laughs> quite a bit. And so if you um, are a part of an organization, if you are a service provider, we uh, and you want to be able to dig deeper into these concepts around reproductive justice, we are an organization that provides those services to make sure that you can actually get the political education necessary to be able to change and shift systems within your work. Um, number two, trust Black women, good people. That, that's just it and that's all. If you are going to be a service provider, if you're out here doing this work, trust Black women, trust what they say to you, trust what they ask you for, um, and just make sure that that is a part of your daily practice. Um, and then thirdly, I would say that if you are a white person right now, when asking about white co-conspirators and things right now, if you're a white person and you are comfortable right now, if you feel real comfortable in life right now, then you're just not doing the work. I'm sorry to tell you, but you're not. Um, and so um, it is time for you, um, if you are down for this work and you want to be in this work, which is about actively working every single day to dismantle the system of white supremacy, there is no way in the world you can be comfortable right now. So we need you to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and so that means that you, it is about how do you use your voice? How do you use your privilege? Yes. And when are you putting yourself on the line for black lives, for black liberation, because that is what is what it's gonna take for us to be able to dismantle the system. It is not the bodies of black people that's going to dismantle the system of white supremacy. It is the very system itself that needs to erupt itself. So um, we need white people to understand that and to be willing to put themselves on the line to make that happen. So again, thank y'all so, so much. Um, and stay connected because we wanna be connected to you. Um, thank you. Um, we are at time, so I don't want to say too much, but I did put something in the chat around weathering because someone asked that question. Um, and I think my other colleagues have already addressed in part some of the other things that were shared. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer um, and Adora. Um, and I'm so glad to be part of this wonderful panel. Um, and uh, Monica and Dazon, I will be talking to y'all. Um, and so uh, let's keep this work going. Thank you. Well, thank thank you. you for the invitation. I'm so oh glad gosh. to be here. Thank you this so much. Above and beyond. I mean, just a really 
fantastic panel. I appreciate all of your time. I appreciate all of your work. Adora, I appreciate your time helping me with this and participating. Um, perfect start to this speaker series. So I'm going to close it out with there. Thank you. Our next um, talk, it will be about disparities in COVID with um, Dr. Shivani Patel from Emory. So keep an eye out for that as well. It's going to be great. Um, and hopefully this recording will be up on the website soon. So keep an eye out for that and reach out to me if you have any additional um, questions or anything. Um, and again, thank you. I appreciate y'all. Thank you.